I've loved worship today, and I just feel, I mean, I know I probably say this most times I get up here, but sometimes I just feel God confirms something in my heart with what he's put on my heart as in worship. And I've just felt that again as we've sung Jesus at the center. Today I'm speaking on Jesus. It's called Speak Jesus. I was going to call it Speak Life, but then um, on our set list today is I Speak Jesus, which we're going to respond with at the end. And I just felt that was such a good fit for uh, what I felt God put on my heart. When I saw the set list today from the worship band, I thought, wow, God, you're doing something today. So uh, I, I really believe that. And we've had Jesus at the center and uh, we've also sung, he is faithful, faithful God. And again, th- those are some of the things that are coming out today. But maybe some of some, the reason some people not feeling too celebratory today is because they were watching the Six Nations last night. I don't know if I'm right there. Anybody watching uh, England, Scotland last night? Oh, a few people. <laughs> it wasn't the result we wanted. Let's just put it like that. Um, but it was a good game. It was a very close game. And... Uh, We're in the last five minutes of the game. It was stolen from us. Uh, What can I say? But what I found interesting about that is in the post-match interviews, the um, Scottish captain said, you know, what was it it like? He was asked, like, what was it like to go into such a close game? You were behind for pretty much the whole match. And he said, we just stuck to our plan and we stayed in the fight. And we knew if we would stick to the plan, we would create winning opportunities. And I thought that was such an interesting bit of kind of sports psychology. You know, when, when you go into something, sticking to the plan and, and uh, staying in the fight. And in that moment, creating winning opportunities. And I think in life, and I think this is something I found... That we're so we can so easy to get sidetracked in life. It's so easy when s- something's happened for something else to take our focus away from Jesus. Uh, it says this. Many of you know this verse, very well known verse, Proverbs eighteen twenty one. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. So. There's something about confessing, uh, speaking something over our lives. There's th- we can either speak words of life or we can speak words of death. And whichever one we speak will lead to fruit in our lives, either fruits of life or fruits of death. In other words, what we confess, we put into practice. That's what we become. We put that into practice. Recently, you know, just to be a bit vulnerable, I think it's quite important sometimes to be a bit vulnerable from the pulpit. And just to be a bit vulnerable with you, I've been studying um, at university, um, distance learning, and I found that really, really challenging. Um, I'm in my final year now, and I'm almost at the point where, you know, I feel like I can't do it. Um, I feel like, oh, I could just quit this. You know, I've caught myself saying things like that. Oh, I can't do this. I could just quit this, you know, I I don't have the time, I don't have the capability, whatever it is, I've caught myself saying those things. Now, I know they're not true about me, I know I can do it, but actually if I, (laughs) yes, Johnny, you could do it, (laughs) come on, Um, do you want the mic back? (laughs) Uh, I know I I can do it, but if I keep confessing I can't do it, you know what will happen? I probably won't. I'll probably quit. So, I, you know, that's what this message is coming out of that kind of tension in my own life of keeping my focus in the right place. And that's what I feel God's talking to me about at the moment. And maybe you can relate to that. Maybe there's something in your life that you've been confessing, you've been facing a situation, and maybe you're confessing, you're speaking over it um, words of death, you know, and you might not recognize that straight away. But maybe as I share today, you'll just start to pinpoint some of those words that actually. That's not actually God's heart in this. That's not what, what Jesus wants me to believe in over this situation. If we speak truth over our life, we will do things that glorify that truth in our lives and we will become filled with hope. We need to learn to speak truth over our lives. It says this, 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins... So we we speak, we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So that's kind of the first kind of thing about confession. We have to start with acknowledging we're not in the place we should be in. 
we have to actually think, God, I've, I've got a problem with the way I'm speaking, and I, I need to say I'm sorry for that, you know, and I need to repent of those words, and then I need to see who God is, that he is faithful. We've sung it today, God is faithful, and, uh, and he forgives us, and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So he changes who we are as we confess. Do you get that? As we, as we speak, as we say, sorry, God, sorry for thinking that way, sorry for doing those actions, whatever it is, he, he is faithful and he comes as, as his faithful self and changes who we are so that we can start to confess a new uh, message in our lives, a message of truth and life. The word um, confess, just to get a bit of background here, and I'm going to go on to talk a little bit about probably the most powerful confession in the Bible, uh, it comes from the Greek word homologo, and that indicates to confess or um, to say, I, I promise, or I admit, or I declare, or I acknowledge, or I pray. So there's a broad spectrum of things that that, that word means. Yeah, yes, it can mean to, to say I'm sorry for something, but it can also mean a lot more than that, to promise something, to admit something, to acknowledge, or to say, even just pray something. And I want to look at maybe the greatest confession in the Bible and many of you might know this uh, from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 16 from 13. It's the confession of Peter. Um, it says this, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of a living God. So there's that confession, that's that declaration, that acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in, uh, in heaven. What powerful verses. I mean, boom, come on. That's awesome, isn't it? Um, so there's something that happens when Peter makes that confession about who Jesus is. But I just want to pull out a few points out of those verses really today. And we're going to have a look at how we can start confessing truth over our lives as we go through that. So the first thing is this. Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is. And then he says, who do you say I am? And you, God asks that to each of us today as disciples, as Christ followers, those here who are Christ followers, that's what he asks of us. He says, who do you say I am? You know, and, and we've got to bring that into our lives and actually question, when we come up against these tough circumstances in life, who is Jesus to me in this circumstance? Is he Lord? Is he center? Is he the one that everything we've been singing about revolving around him? Or has the situation started to revolve around, our life started to revolve about the situation and, and not Jesus? Who, I, who do you say I am? We need to know the identity of Jesus. Peter confesses the identity. He says that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of a living God. And, you know, Jesus acknowledges that is a divine revelation. It's not come from mere you know, flesh and blood, but actually it's been given by, Jesus says, the Father in heaven. And there's some things in life that can, we, they have to come from a revelation of the Father. Truth only comes, real truth. You know, we, we can, we've got to know the difference between facts and truth, right? We can have facts in life, you know, scientific facts. But actually, real truth is a revelation of the Father in heaven. And that's what we have to, we can, we can speak truth, that revelatory truth over facts, actually, over what doctors say, for instance, over what others say. We can learn to speak truth over those things from a revelation from Father God in heaven. The revelation is the key to who Jesus is. Um, 
and, and what he says. So that revelation, who Jesus is and what he says, that, that uh, he's the Messiah, the son of the living God, that identity of Christ, that is what dictates everything he does. That Messiah means he is the Christ. He is the one, the, the one from Israel who came to redeem the world. He came to do that. That is the truth. Um, and what's interesting about this, now, I've heard from this passage preached before um, about Simon the Reed and Peter the Rock. I don't know if anyone else has heard that message. Maybe it's just me. Um, but I, I, I thought, you know, that because that, that preacher's quite, Simon's a reed blown in the wind and now is Peter the Rock st- firm and steadfast. I thought, ah, oh, that preaches really well. But as I started to research it, I couldn't actually find anything that me, that says Simon is the reed, it, like historically. So I think it's one of these things that's got in the echo chambers of preachers and kind of sp- spoken out and around a lot. Um, now, if I'm wrong on that, I'd love to be corrected. So please do come and talk to me. But um, Simon actually means to hear or to listen in Hebrew. So and that's where it comes from. That you know that was the Hebrew name. Uh, so it's not quite you know if you've heard that I'm not having a go at any preachers. In fact, I was so worried about this, I spent several hours this week looking into it, and I, I text for those, you know, Peter Gavana, and, it, and it'd be, it text me back saying, well, Paul, I've preached this, but I've looked into it now, and I can't see it either. So please do correct us if we're wrong on that. But uh, it was just a little interesting note. But that's the second thing that, you know, uh, Jesus calls Peter the rock, or he calls rather his confession the rock. Um, what he says is the rock, because I'm just going to show you what what I mean by that. He says this um, in verse 18, I tell you that you are Peter. Now that word is Petros. It means the rock or the stone. And on this rock, now that's a different word. The second time he says it, it's Petra, which is a slightly different word. Um, it's the feminine form of the word rock, if you like. But it actually has a deeper meaning. It means bedrock or, or foundation. It's what they built houses upon. Um, and it's on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So Peter's said this truth, this revelatory truth. Um, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And it's upon that rock, that, that foundation, that the church won't be overcome. The gates of hell will not overcome it. That's the first point, the foundations for building. Um, so Peter, uh, the confession of Peter is the rock. It says this just to show that in context, like that word Petra. Uh, Matthew 7.24 and Matthew 27.59 and 60. A lot of you will know this story. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So, the, so a rock, you know, just to look in two other verses in Matthew, um, there's this broader understanding of what this Petra is, this, this foundation stone that the wise man builds his house upon. And, and Jesus just says, this confession of Peter, this is the rock. This is what you build your life upon. This is what the church will be built upon. So there's the wise man who builds his house on the rock, and of course the foolish man builds his house on the sand, doesn't he? And it all comes tumbling down in the song that I used to sing in Sunday school. Um, And then the second one, Matthew 27, it says, this is when when Jesus uh, has died. Matthew, uh, sorry, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a a clean linen cloth and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. And again, that's Petra. That's this bedrock. So it's literally cut into a mountainside. I've been out to Jerusalem, seen these tombs cut into the mountainside, and it, it's amazing. And again, this, this is the idea that, that this is bedrock, this is in a mountain, this is something that's firm and will never be moved. Um, and this is what Jesus is saying, I will build my church upon this, this solid foundation. And this is what we need to learn to build our lives upon. So, um, so this applies to everybody. This isn't just for Peter. In this context, you know, Jesus is addressing Peter, but we, we look a bit further on in the Gospel of Matthew, and we actually find that actually Jesus says the same thing to all the disciples. So we're just going to look at Matthew 18, 18, and he says, I tell you, and that you there, that's a plural in the Greek form, 
whereas the one before was in the singular to Peter, but now he, now Jesus expands it to all the disciples. This is to you all. So I could say, truly, I tell you all, whatever you all bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So again, this is a widening out that actually this, this revelatory truth, it's something that we all are called to confess. And then like we can claim that promise that when we are on that foundation, whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm going to explain that a bit more a bit later on. So we as disciples of Jesus can learn to confess truth. We need to know we're called to, to make that confession and stand on that promise of who he is. And then Christ will build his church on that foundation of our faith, that confession of our faith. So the second thing I want to point out of the, these verses is um, about gates, and it's about gates into our lives. So it says this, verse 18 again, and I tell you, Peter, on this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you keys of the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus explains that this confession, this confession of truth, cannot be overcome by the gates of death. The gates of Hades, that's the gates of death. So it's this idea that of a city with gates, and, and we have authority to open and close gates in our lives. That's what this confession is. It gives us the authority to close the gates of Hades into the church so that the gates of Hades cannot overcome it because we have the authority to have keys and to close them so they cannot be overcome. Do you get that? That, That's amazing. So I just want to look at three gates, and I think these are probably three of the things that are probably most well-known in our society, and that's sex, money, and power, which can all be gates into our lives. So I've got three scriptures here what, um, that talk about each of these and, I, and they just explore what it means to have a gate, these gates that we need to close in our, in our lives. So the first one is the gate of sex or, or I'm going to call it the gate of lust which we can actually take authority over and close that gateway into our lives. Um, and I'm going to look at the story of David and Bathsheba so I'm just going to read this um, and just pull out a couple of things about how um, that how David was affected by it. 2 Samuel 11, 2-5. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house. And he saw from the roof a woman bathing. Uh, the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eli- Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messages to fetch her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Oh, dear. (laughs) So things I want us to notice there, like David chose to confess something negative over his life. He, he saw Bathsheba from the roof and then he spoke to somebody, said, I want that woman, go and get her for me, right? So it started in his head and then he, he spoke it and it came into being. So I want us to recognize that, that, you know, with this, with the gate of lust, you know, we've got to check what's going on in our head and how that causes us to act. When da- David saw her and he should have just said, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> Um, I mean, she wasn't innocent in it either, really, because she was on a rooftop. David, in, in the city of David, it was the highest place, so she was advertising herself to him. And he, sh- he should have been aware of that and closed that off. Um, but actually, he doesn't do that, and he chooses instead to confess, actually, I want her, go and get her for me. So it starts with that confession that, that, that you know, we spoke at the start, life and death are in the power of a tongue, and he chose to speak something that would lead into death. Um, so he, he comes, he lays with her. Again, that, that confession then becomes action. Um, and then we see the fruit of that, that she is pregnant. And eventually we find out actually the baby dies as a judgment of that. So actually it does, does lead to death in that scenario. That gateway that he should have just nipped in the bud straight away, that gateway of lust um, that he should have nipped in the bud straight away actually led to 
the death. And that, that's awful to see. And he should have caught that sooner. And I think we can learn from that. Second one is this, the gate of greed. Um, so that's, that's the money one, um, how that can be um, something that we can allow the devil to work in our hearts on. Um, and I'm going to read out of um, Luke 12, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed you, me to be a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build, my, and build bigger ones. And I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you... Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. I mean, that's a powerful parable, isn't it? Um, and the gate of greed, it can be a massive one, especially in our culture, which is a bit money-obsessed. Um, and again, I just want us to recognize the pattern here. The man starts with a confession. He says that I've got loads of grain basically my barns are overflowing and i'm going to build bigger grain so i can be late you know i can retire and i can have it laid up for many years and i can eat drink and be merry that's his confession right and that that isn't the way of the kingdom of god that isn't the way of the church and so at that very night he dies the very night that he confessed that it led to death and he, he should have, I mean, I know it's a parable, but if we apply that to real life, he should have caught that and actually said, actually, this isn't what God's calling me to do. But actually, I've got to be generous with my wealth. I've got to be generous with my money. Even with my little, I've got to be generous. And um, so, again, we could see his confession, um, something he says that leads to death. And the final one is this, the gate of power. The gate of power. And I want to show this in a slightly different light. I'm going to show this with a positive take on it, um, where we see actually someone confesses something and it, uh, how it leads to um, a good thing. So the gate of power, I'm going to read from Matthew 26, 47. And this is in the, the story um, where Jesus is betrayed. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived with him, and with him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, "This, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place. For all who take life by the sword will perish by the sword. So there you see Jesus in this moment where there's an army come to arrest him and his disciples want to raise up as an army as well and fight their fight. But Jesus chooses not to demonstrate power. In fact, he goes on to say that, you know, didn't, don't the disciples know that at a word he could command angels' armies to come and fight for him? But he chooses to lay that power down in order for the kingdom of God to come. So he chooses to close that gate of the enemy, the, that gate of, of the enemy that w wants to take away the salvation of the world, literally, in that moment. And uh, he chooses to close that gate and instead be peaceful, laying down his power, becoming humble, as we've shared on that verse, becoming, um, considering himself nothing 
in, the, in front of others, but actually coming humble and giving it to God. And he says, put your sword back into its place. So that's his confession. You know, don't raise up for me, but actually lay your swords down. And he confesses peace over the situations. And he, and he also heals the high priest's ear in this amazing moment, which is so countercultural. So that's, that's the gate of power. And Jesus chooses to slam that one shut with that confession of peace. So his confession is put into action again with the healing of the ear, and then he's taken away. So he chooses to close that gate of the enemy into his life. Okay, so my final point is this, keys to the kingdom, keys to the kingdom. And it says this, Matthew 16, 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So the keys to the kingdom are given so that people would be freed from the power of sin and death. So the the key to the kingdom is the gospel message. It is saying, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. That is the key. We need to learn to declare that truth, put those keys in those gates and close them off. But then also, as we speak truth over other, other people's lives, we can unlock and give them revelation of who Jesus is as well. So when, when Jesus says, who am I to you? And we confess, Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. We can then invite others through our testimony to say, actually, who is God to you? Who is God to you? Who is God to you in that situation? And he can be their revelatory truth and actually say, you come into the kingdom. Come into the kingdom. So that's what that means. To be bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's letting people into the heaven, releasing them, allowing them to come into the heaven and, and allowing that truth in heaven to come to earth and meet them, the people. So we've got to be aware of that. So I want to put that first picture up of that tree, if that's okay. Now, it's quite a small picture. This is a little seedling of um, what's called, is the type of fig tree. And um, it's been probably put there from some bird droppings that have eaten the figs, and it's been put there on the tree. And it's just take, starting to grow um, on that fig tree. And, and this can be a picture of, of things that we confess in our lives, things that we speak about ourselves or about our world, about our church, about our family, about workplace. Oh, I could go on. Um, so and and that that's there and and say we we start speaking negatively about these things and it starts to grow if you go on the next one Dan so what it does it starts to put down roots so you can see these long trails coming down from the tree now and these are massive long roots like 50 feet long coming down to the ground and they start to take root in the ground and absorb it and they start to grow and the whole thing starts to grow so if you go on to the next one Dan what happens is these roots start to keep growing and growing, and they start to tangle up around the tree. And the tree is actually called a, um, a strangler tree. And it starts to bind itself around this tree and literally choke the, the life out of it. And, you know, that can be the same for, for us in our lives. Sometimes the things we confess, the things we can believe about ourselves, they can, they can come on and start to take the life out of us. You know, there can be words of power that can lead to death. And we see that in this final picture, that now uh, the tree's gone. You can see straight through those, um, those roots now, and the tree's completely gone. And that, it's quite a scary picture, actually, of what it can do to you, you know, of, of how something that we allow to grow in our lives can actually cause us to die. And that's what those, those two stories there, you know, um, tell us about about David you know how he confessed something and it led to to death and about the rich man he confessed something and it led to death these things then don't take them lightly don't take them lightly learn to confess truth over it to knit that if you go back to that first picture to knit that seedling in the bud it says just a small thing and it would just take actually God I'm not going to say that over myself I'm not going to say that over this situation I'm going to choose to revolve around you as we've sung today. So I'm going to ask the band to come up. up, um, And we're going to sing together in a few minutes, I Speak Jesus, so if they can just get ready for that. And we're going to respond with that song. 
But I just want to go through a quick um, statement, things that we can do practically to help us to get some victory in these areas. So we have to have three statements. The first one is a he is statement. Um, when we confess, so we can confess that he is faithful and just. And we read that today um, in 1 John 1 9. He is faithful and just to forgive us. So think what you're going through and actually, God, what, who are you to me in this situ- situation? When Jesus says, who, are, who am I? Actually, God, in this situation, who are you to me? And maybe I've written there like God is faithful and just. Maybe that's what we need to declare, who he is. Peter declared, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Who is Jesus? He is faithful and just. And as we start to declare that statement, it actually starts to um, form our identity. And it acts toward getting rid of those seedlings in our life, those things that can come in and, and strangle that. And it forms our identity. And then that becomes an I am statement. And I've just put here, I am able to confess Jesus in every situation because I am forgiven, I am cleansed, I am made righteous, and I am now content. You know, as we confess things over our lives, as we say, I am this, you know, over my studies, I've been saying, I I am able to do this because God has put that ability in me. He can help me in that. We can learn to confess that over ourselves I am and that leads us into an I can statement or an I do statement it leads us into action about something because of who Jesus is I am this and I can now do something about it our identity our identity defines what we do about it and and that can be you know literally ripping out that that strangler fig tree ripping that out of our lives. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to rip that out. I'm, I'm not going to f- confess that stuff over my life anymore. So I can live as a disciple, confessing Jesus in every situation. And I can do his work and tell others of his truth and help them as well. It says this in Philippians 4. I know what It is to be in need, Paul says, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That is a confession that we need to make today over our lives. I can do this. I can live as a disciple of Jesus, no matter what's going on in the world. You know, Paul's not saying, you know, everything's going to be perfect. But he's saying whatever situation, whether we have a lot or a little, we can be content. But we need to learn to confess that over our lives, over that truth in our lives. We need to learn to confess that over our marriages. You know, we were talking about, um, Emma and I, about this a little bit. And we were saying sometimes... You know, we can say stuff like, you always do that, or you always do that. And actually, we've got to stop saying things like that, because that's, that's not our identity. That, that's, what we, that's our action, but that doesn't have to be our identity. And we've got to change our language. So we, we try and talk, said, say things like, would you be able to, you know, <laughs> like pick your washing up off the floor? <laughs> or I know I like talking about my washing on <laughs> up here. But, um, or would you be able to? And we try it like... We're trying to work on changing our language around that area. Um, over our money, we can learn to confess different things over our money. Um, you know, some, like we all want more money, don't we, right? Um, but actually, we can have actually say, God, you've given me enough to survive today. You know, God, we pray, God, um, give me this day our daily bread. You know, he has enough for our daily need. Um, we need to learn to confess truth over our family and the I can's over our family and not the I can't you know there's so many people in here I'm sure their their parents their grandparents have said things over them that that actually have become an I can't or you'll never amount to anything or you'll never do this or you'll never do that and that is a lie at the end of that is a gate of Hades that we need to put a key of the kingdom in and lock that one once and for all and actually declare I can do it because of my identity in Christ and who Christ is. 
Um, I was talking, like, Pete Ratcliffe brought up a good one at the prayer meeting last Wednesday. He said, you know, so much negativity over our town um, and over towns in general. Like, we can speak negativity about, oh, you talk so what, what good's come out of you talk so or you know i could say the same about my hometown all the high streets closing down and all this negativity all this negative talk we've got going around over our area and we've got to recognize that for what it is those are words that lead to death and we've got to learn to speak jesus truth over it and speak life and actually say god you love you talkster you want to see the people here saved you, you're calling this people to grow and develop and, and build an amazing town. I genuinely believe you talk to could be an amazing Christian town. And let's believe that. But we've we got to learn to not confess death, but confess life over our, our area, our workplace. You can say, oh, my boss never says thank you. Or, you know, things like that. My, my boss isn't grateful for anything. Or I work with a bunch of I'm not going to go any further, <laughs> um, which I don't. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we can confess life over our workplaces. And, y- you know, that starts with us. That starts with us being the difference, us being the change. It's, this isn't just a feel-good message. This is a challenging message. This is We're trying to get into what's going on in our own heads. What are, we, what are our lives revolving around in us? And what truth are we believing in ourselves so that we can then practice it to others around it so when we do this and i say we i include myself we're all on this journey together i believe we'll see our communities are transformed empowered with a people full of hope our own lives will be transformed and our churches will be filled with disciples people who say i choose to make this declaration of truth over our life. So we're going to literally do that right now. We're going to sing, I speak Jesus. And as we do that, I just want you to just cry out in yourself. If there's an area that I've touched on today where you literally need to close that gate in your life, um, I want you, while we sing this, just to speak the name of Jesus over that area, to speak truth, because that is the key to closing that gate so that Jesus can build his church. Is that okay, church? Right, just stand with me.